And welcome everyone to another episode of Broken Families, where we host conversations on divorce, parental alienation, and high conflict relationships. My name is Andrew Faulkner. And I'm Barbara LaPointe. Today we're going to discuss conflict resolution and healing inner work. And that is why we have brought on a guest speaker to really help us dig deep into this important topic. Penny has been teaching relationship strategies for over 25 years with powerful metaphors like play nice in the sandbox. Penny has trained large companies across the world about how to manage conflict in the world, in the workplace, and within our family systems. She has developed multiple programs to help her students build a powerful system of healthy relationships without compromising on personal boundaries. So without further ado, welcome Penny. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. I'm very honored to be a part of your Broken Families podcast. Thank you. Well, we're super excited to have you. And as you know, we talk a lot about conflict, but you talk about conflict as an inside job. And I was just curious, what does that mean? Well, that is such a great question because in my understanding of conflict and how we show up to relationships, which like you said, are everywhere. We have relationships at home, at work, uh, you know, in our communities, so much of how we show up today has, has an influence from the past. So often when we look at uh, the conflict that we're dealing with on any given moment of any given day, we can take a real good look at how we are showing up. So here's another example. Oftentimes when people hear that there's a play nice in the sandbox training coming to their workplace or uh, you know, coming to a, a session that they get to go to, they get really excited. They say like, oh yay, you know, playing in the sandbox. I can relate to that fun metaphor. And they think that in the process, um, I'm gonna help fix everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> right? But the reality is that the greatest opportunity to resolve conflict is an inside job, meaning it's my work, it's Penny's work to work on how I uh, get attached to conflict or how conflict affects me. It's Barbara's work to, to work on Barbara so that she can, you know, move through conflict on a regular basis without it really having a stronghold effect on her and so on. So, um, what I hope that people will understand is that um, there is only one person that they really have control over, and that's themselves. And the more that they try to relinquish control of other people, other circumstances that are outside their control, the more effective they're going to be at finding that peace. And, um, you know, when you think about, when you get really honest with yourself, and you think about all of the conflict uh, or, or all that you are showing up with that is contributing to the conflict that's appearing in your life, you've got a lot of work to do, <laughs> right? I mean, when you're really honest with yourself, if you're vulnerable enough and honest enough to say, you know, this is mine and this is mine and oh man, this is from my past and it's still showing up today, you have a ton of work to do. And so if you could just embrace that work and let other people find their way and let other people do their own work, then you're, you're, take, you're at least taking on a job, a responsibility that you can influence, that you can control. And you're letting everything else go that's outside your control. So that's about the best ex explanation that I can give you. Um, it's probably the best explanation I've ever given you know, just to really help people understand that most of conflict resolution is an inside job. It's about preparing ourselves to face and embrace the things that come up on a regular basis and look at what's ours and what's not and take on what's ours and reflect on it and really understand where it's coming from. Why does that trigger me? You know, why does that trigger me, but it doesn't trigger him or her and um, recognizing you know, our, our strengths and our weaknesses and, and then being vulnerable enough about it to speak about it honestly and to own it. 
Yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, uh, that description reminds me a lot about uh, was it Alan Watts' backwards law, how where we when we want something, oftentimes we we chase after it, and it's almost like we're chasing something that's always just out of our grasp. But the moment we stop chasing it and we relinquish control, that that is when we're able to actually attain it. Yeah, exactly. That is exactly. You know, uh, there's just there's just so much skill required to maneuver through our own lives that, you know, just understanding the mindset that you just talked about there about recognizing that so much of what we're chasing is already inside us. It's not about getting something more or getting more skills or getting more stuff or getting more relationship or getting more love. It's about remembering, re remembering what's already here in us and mining for that and you know pulling out the nuggets and dusting them off and polishing them off and really recognizing how pure and perfect that we came into this world and you know moving through life with a, a desire to unpack all of that stuff i so agree with you penny but sometimes and so often people avoid conflict yeah and if, and, and so what what do you say to those people that have moved through life or moved through workplace, avoiding conflict or avoiding doing that inner work and checking in or, or in a workplace uh, with so many unmanaged emotions? How, how can we address those? those One of the ways I explain that, that concept in my seminars and uh, keynotes and written material is that, um, have you ever gone to the carnival and played whack-a-mole? Yes. You know, you, you've got that big hammer and the clock set and you know, those moles keep popping up in the holes and you have to keep hammering them down. And, you know, you're just like whacking. You whack one down, out it pops over here, out it pops. And at the end of two minutes or five minutes or whatever that time frame is, you're literally exhausted from trying to keep the moles from popping up. That's what it's like trying to put a lid on and keep suppressed all of the resentment and bad feelings and, and, and old stories, which are mostly fiction, uh, trying to keep them down. And you've got this filter because we know from our, our, our upbringing and our training and you know whatever influences that we've had in life that we really should show up a certain way. So from the neck up, we're supposed to be some professional worker who, you know, can handle and manage stress, but like from the neck down, we're just like a bundle of turmoil, like a bunch of moles just wanting to pop out, you know, and we innately want to behave a certain way, but our filter has to keep going. Nope. Can't say that. Oh no. Can't use the F-bomb. Oh no. You can't, you know, you can't call this person out or, Oh no, you can't challenge what your boss says because, you know, and all of these things, you know, it takes a lot of energy to keep them down. So what if we could just live an authentic life and talk about things as they're coming up and learn to talk about them in a way that's not hostile, that's not aggressive, it's not intimidating, you know, but just to be really honest with people and just to, just to be able to have the skills to say something like, you know, there's something that I has, I've been thinking about for days and I really want to uh, have an opportunity to share it with you. You know, like, would you be willing to talk about um, what happened yesterday? Or, you know, would it be okay if I get your opinion on something? When, when we're able to do that, we, we, we don't have to have that filter to keep things down. One of the things that I often say is where there is resentment, there can be no relationship. And if there is, it's kind of fake. It's not kind of fake. It's fake. Let's face it. You know, it's like um, you're you're not authentic. You're not just living into who you really are and what you think. And and you know from relationships that you have how some of them are just so real and true and authentic. And you get to show up and you get to be your awesome self and you get to be your, your horrible self and you get to be everything you are in the moment just by being honest and sharing that. And the person that you have that relationship with just loves you no matter what, right? Like, isn't that peace? Isn't that the definition of peaceful relationships? But you're right, Barbara. 
people avoid conflict. And I think a lot of it is because of our, our upbringing where we weren't taught to, we weren't taught how to, or given permission to speak up and just be honest because we were made to think that that was wrong or that the person that we're being honest with was feeling wrong. So somehow that's our fault, you know, because we're honest and you feel, you know, you feel like you've done something wrong. Like also our, our, perhaps our religious backgrounds and upbringings, um, cultural backgrounds and upbringings, perhaps there's something that, you know, you said in school that, you know, you got in trouble for, I mean, like I said, we carry these stories but they're mostly fiction. And we really need to dissect those beliefs. They're limiting beliefs. We need to dissect them. And, uh, and so one of the things that I often say is that you have to be doing your own work. You have to be doing your own work, meaning your own internal stuff, right? And people get what I mean when I say that. Some people get what I mean really clear, like, oh, I know what you mean. I have to do my personal development. I have to do my journaling or my work or however they do their personal reflections or their, their work with a counselor. And, but some people don't get it. They don't understand what I mean when I say that. What do you mean my internal work? I've learned it as uh, your work with a capital W. It's, it's sacred work. It's very important. It's the highest priority work that you can do and it's very valuable um, being able to recognize you know even just how you manage through conflict and and then you can take you can start connecting some dots you can take a look at how are the other relationships in my life or let me start that over how is this pattern showing up in other relationships of my life because we often um, exit one relationship thinking that the grass is greener on the other side and then we do it again and then we do it again only to realize that there's only one common denominator. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's always a fun aha moment. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a painful one for a lot of people considering that they're in a way reenacting either traumatic moments in their lives by uh, just replacing one bad relationship with another one. Yeah. And, and, and that's an option. Like when you say painful, that's one option. Yep. You can think like that. You can think this is painful, or you can also recognize that this is a golden nugget because you get to change that, right? It's, it's back to what I said about really understanding what's yours and what's not yours and what you have control of and what you don't have control of. Like, Stephen Covey's habit number one in seven habits of highly effective people is to be proactive, right? Is like, so when I'm working with people, teams, individuals, coaching people, I often say, well, the very first step is like getting people to understand that they're responsible. They are responsible to create the life that lights them up. It's nobody else's responsibility. When you start giving that power away to somebody else, that's when you're in trouble, right? Because um, you're powerless. You've given pieces of your power away to somebody else. And, and that's what happens when you blame somebody. You give pieces of your power away to them. And as long as they're holding those pieces of power, you will never be complete because you're, you've given away pieces of your power. Um, I think of it like a puzzle. You're trying to put your own puzzle of life together, but you've given a piece to him in a previous decade. You've given a piece to her, you know, you've given a piece to your grade six teacher when, when she told you that you'll never amount to anything or you won't be a good writer because your essay stunk, right? You give pieces of yourself away to people and then you try to put together this puzzle of like, this is the powerful penny, but I've got holes in my puzzle. And so, you know, we have to recognize how, we need to take back those pieces and, and own them. And this is where we need to have a lot of other skills that I talk about in the sandbox strategies, because I think it's just really common nature to blame others, right? It's just common, Absolutely. you know, it just seems like the easy thing to do. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. But when you were talking about giving away your power pieces of yourself, and your core kind of becomes like Swiss cheese. Isn't that when you feel out of control? Yes. Or out of control in conflict? Right. 
because you can't control pieces that you've given away. Right? You, you can't do that. And, um, and so then you have to haul out a whole new set of tools. Like, how do I, re how do I repair those holes in me? And that's where tools like um, empathy and compassion for others, for the humanness of other people, forgiveness, um, things like that, you know, come into play. Conflict, you know, conflict really interests me because I get to help people work through it, right? And one of the most important things that I say is that there's only one way through conflict and that's through it. You can't go over it or around it or under it. You have to go through it. You've got to go through the fire. And that's what's uncomfortable for people because it, conflict is uncomfortable or else it wouldn't be called conflict. It would be called like, you know, ice cream sundaes with a cherry on top or something, right? Um, but it's also that other side of life that gives us contrast. If we didn't have the night, we wouldn't appreciate the day. If we didn't have the light, we wouldn't appreciate the dark, right? If we didn't have the joy, we wouldn't appreciate the conflict. So yeah. it's that side that helps us um, stay the course. And, um, and when we feel agitated, it helps us understand that we've veered off of our, our path, right? Like we're, we're, we're agitated and doesn't mean that anything's wrong. One of the most powerful things that I have adopted for myself and I encourage people to adopt is losing this judgment that things are either right or wrong. It's, it's not right or wrong. It doesn't have to be. You, you can make it whatever you want, but it doesn't have to be right or wrong. How about it just is what it is? right? It just is what it is. And then it's just fact, right? Or it's just your perception of fact. And, and so, and so what, you know? So, yeah, you know, I can, I can, I can make better use of that example when we're actually talking about a specific conflict. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, it, a lot of what you've said reminds me of, uh, especially Carl Jung's integrating the shadow um, and if you include Joseph Campbell's monomyth, um, that really wraps the whole concept around where, you know, you're, and for those who don't know, the monomyth is a, the hero's journey. There's also the heroine's journey, regardless. It's a, it's a pathway where we are initiated into a long journey of self discovery and self improvement. And we enter various stages of conflict and we seek out mentor figures and go through the with it what is called the divine world or the uh, the underworld um, and we go through these trials and tribulations only to come out as a master of two worlds uh, and I know at least per uh, Carl Jung I mean he's kind of mentioned this as well with integrating the shadow and uh, and other psychologists have reflected on how the myths in our in our days and age are re reflected on this idea so you would have for example the story of achilles or even orpheus and greek myths where they're entering the underworld and only in coming out stronger and more powerful and this is symbolic of their ability to go through those challenges go back deeper into the subconscious find out more about themselves and then return to the present world as a stronger and better person. That sounds phenomenal. I'd love to spend some time in, in exactly that because, you know, the, the, um, the skills that are required to move through conflict, to resolve conflict, to maintain peace and, and productivity. Cause I think we live in a pretty, uh, pro um, uh, world where productivity is important. You know, these aren't new skills. These, are, these aren't, it, it's not like, hey, we're in a pandemic. We need a whole new set of tools. We do need tools that are new to our toolbox, but they're, they're ancient. And, and there's history about them and there's philosophy about them. And there's a lot of examples and stories. And, and I think that's one of the things that, may, that makes learning stick is when we can really grab a hold of, of a concept in a different way that resonates with us and go, oh yeah, 
you know, one of the things that I often say is that uh, communication is an art, not a science. It will never be perfect, right? It will never be perfect. So we have to just keep living into our, our daily lives and, and, and giving it the best shot we can. We, you know, we don't win them all. If you've watched my manifesto video, you know, I talk about a conflict that, that I've been through personally in my life. And, and, um, one of the, one of the reasons why we did that video is because the videographer that I hired to do a manifesto video about me and my work, he asked me in a survey, you know, tell me about some of the conflicts that you have resolved. And, uh, I was assuming he was talking about workplace conflicts that I have helped teams work through. And so I gave him a couple of those examples, but then I also gave him a personal one. And uh, one day I was out walking uh, on a frozen lake in Northern Ontario. Um, beautiful uh, day. I was training with a group of people and we were on a lunch break and I often bring my, my golden retriever uh, lab with me. Her name is Joy. Uh, she travels with me whenever possible. And I was out on this frozen lake walking at lunch with Joy and the phone rang and it was my videographer. And he said, uh, yeah, I read through your questionnaire and I've decided I'd like to do the story on your personal conflict um, with your boy. And I was like, oh, okay. And I just, I somehow knew that he was going to pick that one, but a part of me just didn't want to, I guess a part of me didn't think that it was applicable to workplace conflict. And I said, oh, okay, are you sure? He goes, oh, I'm sure. And then I started to cry. Like, I'll never forget that moment. I'm, I'm walking on the ice with my cell phone and I'm like, you know, the tears are freezing on my face and, and I'm just um, crying tears of, I, I, I don't know what, you know, I'm thinking about it right here and now with you. Um, I guess I was, I was shedding tears of, uh, of um, fear, maybe, you know, uh, how, how this story was going to um, be a, a story for, for business. Um, fear of, you know, what, how this was going to land with my, with my, with my children and, and, uh, and the people who know us, et cetera, et cetera, because, you know, you try to sweep some of these things under the carpet, right? Especially when you're like the conflict guru, and then you, you've you got this personal conflict. And, and it was, I think, a process of really embracing the vulnerability around that, that so much richness came to my brand. And so, so many things that have developed from that, where, you know, I've said things like conflict resolution is an inside job. And I say, um, you know, communication is an art, not a science. Uh, you know, it'll never be perfect, but we have to keep trying. I say things like, you know, you could be trained at Harvard and have worked for decades in the industry and written books and blogs on the topic, but that doesn't mean that you're going to win them all. And, and that story is all of those things. Also, I say playing nice doesn't always mean being nice, right? So a lot has come from the, my own personal conflicts. That's just one of them. Um, you know, we, I'm certainly open to talking more about that because we're on a broken families podcast, but you know, when you have somebody who's claims to be a work, an expert on relationships who can actually tell you, like, I understand. Cause I've been there, I've been through it and, and we still go through it. And as you said, in the beginning, Barb, conflict is inevitable. It's everywhere. It's, it's going to be consistent and, but suffering is optional. And that's the point that I really want people to understand is that, you know, there is a lot that you can do for yourself to help you move through conflict on a regular basis. So if we were to just take this moment to pause and consider someone who hadn't watched your manifesto video, which was really uh, deeply emotional for me to watch. Um, I'm just curious, you know, maybe you could just unfold that a bit, what that video is about, why it was important for you to make, and how it's affected people when you tell that story on stage. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, the manifesto video is uh, 
five or six minute video that was developed to um, speak to who I am and why I do what I do and the work that I do. Basically, you know, as a keynote speaker, some speakers might call it a sizzle reel, but I'm more than a speaker. Um, speaking is a way that I, I get my message across, but I am, um, you know, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm a mom, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm a woman in business. Um, I'm a woman who's, who's, who hasn't settled for uh, romantic relationships that weren't um, healthy. Um, um, I've broken the mold in my family where, you know, everybody stayed married, happy or not. I'm a mediator. I do mediation work. Um, I'm a trainer. I've done, I've trained for, I've trained adults in, um, you know, seminars for over two decades, uh, like over three decades, actually, I'm really showing my age, but I'm also a speaker and I'm an author. And so the manifesto video was basically developed to showcase who I am and the business that I have is very unique. Um, you know, some people know me as a motivational and um, inspirational speaker. That's great. It's actually a very small percentage of my business revenue. Um, I do help organizations and workplaces have better relationships and that requires a lot of training. Um, you know, personal, I say people are hired for their technical skills, but fired or stuck in dead end positions due to their lack of ability to get along with people. And um, often that, that the lack of those skills show up when people start moving up the corporate ladder to like frontline front line supervisors and managers and senior managers and so on. I mean, their ability to influence and to get people wanting to do good work for them is a skill set that is really important. And people don't quit bad jobs, they quit bad managers. The manifesto video was developed to showcase who I am and what I do. And then, you know, the, the, the very great videographer, his name is Josh Parley from uh, his business is called Defiant Astronaut. Um, he, he gave me this questionnaire and he asked me a bunch of questions and then he framed the story. So basically his art is in storytelling for businesses. Um, so basically, if you haven't seen the manifesto video, it's on the main page of my website, pennytromblay.com. It's, it's called My Story. And um, it's, it showcases who I am and what I do. And, um, you know, conflict, corporate conflict is a $359 billion industry in North America. And that's pre-pandemic numbers. And, and in fact, those are getting to be pretty old numbers. So if you haven't heard that number before, you know, it's a shocker. It's made up of, of um, you know, lost time, sick leave, high turnover, um, you know, lost productivity, litigation costs, investigations, and so on. I mean, it's a really high, high cost. But, you know, as a, as a small business, I can't imagine how something like that could impact my bottom line and, you know, could, could take me out very, very quickly. So I want to do what I can to change that and to help people really connect and, and to be efficient. Cause you know, when you're a small business, efficiency is everything. So that, you know, that's the purpose of the video. But one of the stories that I tell in the video is a story that I also started telling from stage, um, you know, uh, back in 2014, after um, a 16 year long uh, loveless, I'll say marriage, it, although it wasn't a formal marriage, it was a common law situation, um, I walked. And uh, it was my decision to do that. Um, but there was a lot of, you know, a lot of years of pent up reasons why. And people on the outside would have not known that. I mean, if they looked at our family, we had pretty much everything, um, including the white picket fence and the golden retriever and, you know, uh, a boy and a girl. And like, we had the million dollar family and we had the nice house and, the, you know, a couple of nice cars and our kids, you know, had everything that, uh, uh, you know, double income families, basically, you know, we had a lot of sports and, and uh, we had people over and family and, and we had a beautiful cottage on the lake and a, a lot of wonderful, amazing 
things. In fact, we, um, we even had a live-in caregiver, but the relationship itself had no substance and I was empty and I was dying inside. And, and so, um, um, after years and years and years of trying to change that, I, I threw in my towel and I walked and, and it created a divide, um, because, uh, we had two teenage children watching it all, um, 13 year old daughter and a 15 year old son. And my daughter decided to come and spend a week with me and, and a week with her dad, um, who still lived in the, in the family home. I moved out and my son didn't and he broke ties with me he broke relationship with me and i never thought when i made the decision to to you know to save myself that i would not be able to save my children as well um and and so you know i, I was broken i i i made a move i didn't have my boy in my life anymore and and that's really hard you know, that that's really hard to think, you know, and I, uh, I'm sure that there will be a lot of people listening to this who, who, who don't have their children in their life, or who um, didn't realize at the time that they made those choices, the impact that it would have on the dynamic of the family, including the children and relationships and going forward and whatnot. Um, and so, that was, you know, that, that was really, really tough time for me because, um, uh, well, I mean, I think it goes without saying, you know, you, 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 you build a baby, you birth a baby, you feed a baby, you bond with that baby, you raise that baby. And then all of a sudden, you know, that baby has got a door closed and there's really not a lot of control that you have. Like I, I really didn't have a lot of control because, you know, he was old enough that, um, um, there was no, the, like, I couldn't fight legally in the court system for him. Um, he, you know, uh, although a, ju a judge could rule, yes, you have to go spend time with your mother. Like he, 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 he wouldn't have to. Right. And so, um, it was just an opportunity for me to really work on me. I mean, to recognize what I could and couldn't control. I couldn't control my boy. I couldn't control the influence that he was under from his father. I couldn't control um, much. I couldn't control the rumors that were going around in, in our small town about me. I couldn't control, um, you know, the friendships that I had lost because people had sided, had taken sides. I mean, there was just so much that I couldn't control that I was forced to do my own work, to dig in and to really recognize and to hone and to put everything I had known and learned and taught to test, you know, to really put it to test. And I'll tell you when, when, when I'm working with a team in conflict, I'm involved, but I'm not emotionally involved, right? I mean, this is their conflict. This is not mine. And when you're in it, it's completely different. And you don't, you don't necessarily know how to use the skills from that perspective. And so it was such a learning opportunity for me to, um, to kind of like eat what, eat what I've been dishing out to other people, you know, as far as a prescription, you know, I, I dish out a lot of prescriptions. None of them are pharmaceutical, by the way, they're all like exercises and activities and do this and, you know, write this and journal on that or think about or, you know, like, let's have this conversation. When do you want to have it? And of course, nobody wants to eat that pie. Right. So I had to, I had to um, experience it. And, and it was probably one of the most painful um, conflicts in my life because I, I just felt so displaced. I felt unimportant I felt like, like I didn't matter. And, and, um, and then I realized that all of these feelings were within my control, you know, and recognizing how I wanted to feel, uh, and really getting clear on how I wanted to feel and how I wanted things to go, you know, what kind of a person that I would have to show up as to attract that, to attract that back in my life. And there were some very, very significant things that happened. So, you know, in summary, at this point, we're um, 
uh, one, two, three years into a separation where my boy is not um, responding to me. He's not picking up what I'm putting down. He's not, he's not willing to connect with his mom. And one of the things that people would often say, which really annoyed me is, oh, he'll come around. Oh, oh yeah. Like I, I just wanted to choke people who said that like I just wanted to be and I'd be like you know the the inside me the the moles that I had to slam down were like oh yeah like when like tell me when like it's been you know like it's been months or it's been years like when is he gonna come around but there were some really subtle things that a key few people in my life influenced me with and I'm gonna share those with you and and your listeners um one of them is I have a I have a very good friend. His name is Barry, and um, he's a, he's a motivational speaker. He's written uh, uh, books with Jack Canfield. He lived across the street from me. He was kind of like who, who I wanted to be when I grow up, and and uh, we're still great friends today. But I was talking to him one day, and and of course I was willing to share my my honesty with people who asked, and you know it's it. And there would be a lot of tears and, uh, and I, I, I've learned to love tears and welcome tears because it's just like ice around the heart that's melting. And, and so I was vulnerably sharing with Barry one day and he said, ah, oh, geez, Penny, you know, it seems like you're holding on to this so tight. You need to let it go so that God can pick it up. And that was life changing for me because I realized that I was trying to control things that were outside of my control and I needed to let it go. I needed to let it go so that the higher powers to be could pick it up and make it whatever it needed to be. But I still had me and I still had my work to do and I was just going to let it go. And that forced me to trust. It really forced me to trust that, you know what? I'm a good person. I've been a good person. I could be a better person. I'm going to work on being a better person. Good things will come to me. And through this process, a lot of kids wanted to hang out with me. I did work with youth and they would call me and text me and email me and cheer me on and follow my Facebook posts and call me when they were struggling and um, accept my monetary gifts and donations and all of this. I had a lot of kids. I just didn't have the one that I needed so badly, you know, until I stopped needing it so badly. And I just realized that I, I needed to let this go for my own sanity. Um, there's a, I'll call her a medical intuitive, other people call her a psychic, uh, but uh, her name is Karen Sarlo and uh, she's from my community. And I, and I see Karen um, once in a while. And one day I, you know, I went to, for a session with Karen, she goes, hi, so why are you here? I said, I want to know about my son. She's like, what about him? I said, when's he coming back? She goes, not for a while. I said, that, that is not the answer I wanted. She said, I know, but you know what? And the next thing she said also was life-changing for me. She said, your son's on a journey with his father right now, and you're not supposed to be on it. Wow. That was life changing for me because what I got out of that was like, if life is this grand, then this is a tiny blip in time. This is a small blip in time where my son and his father are on a journey and I'm not supposed to be on it. So I could accept that, you know, because I could see the before and the after the blip. I could see I, it gave me hope. You know, um, she said they're on a journey right now, meaning not like, you know, your son will never be back. She just said right now. And so that was really important for me. And, you know, of all the counseling I had been through and trust me, I had a great counselor and I, I milked my benefit plan and spent every cent that I could to, to, you know, to speak to him because although, you know, I'm supposed to be this guru that knows all of these great things. Um, I don't know everything. And like I said, I'm in it, right? I'm in the middle of it. So the emotions really take over the logic at this point. And then 
Another friend of mine, her name is Sandy um, from Sudbury. I call her Super Sandy from Sudbury. Um, she had been through uh, a change, you know, in her marital status, and uh, and she had two boys, and she said. Um, uh, you know, that she loved it when she cooked bacon and her kids were over and they were just hover around the stove. And I said, I can't wait to cook bacon for my boy. Um, but she said, Penny, it's like feeding the birds. She said, if you're standing there to feed the birds, you stand very still, you put out the offering and you just wait. And sometimes the birds will come and sometimes the birds won't come. And sometimes the birds will come and they'll land and sometimes they won't land and sometimes they'll come and they'll land and they'll eat and sometimes they won't but just keep on feeding the birds and that was a significant metaphor for me because what it meant was i had to put myself out there i had to put my offering out to my son in a way that wasn't going to scare him off you know it wasn't going to like when you're standing there feeding the bird you're not like come on bird where are you bird you know you're just standing there very quietly and you know very peacefully and you're trying to attract this bird to come and to land and if he comes and he lands like you don't say where have you been you know you say not too much you say i'm so glad you're here and you put out the food, which of course is bacon, and um, you hope that they stick around and you hope that they come back and you hope that they're hungry for more of what, what mom has to offer. And so those were some really significant teachings and learnings um, that, that I went through in this process, in this you know time period where uh, I, I was wanting to you know, take the high road and, and my counselor, my, my, you know, I call him my shrink. I don't know if that's rude. Let me know if it is because I'll stop using that term. But, you know, it's kind of funny. And I want to bring humor and playfulness into this topic of conflict because, um, you know, recognizing that there's nothing wrong with seeking counsel to get the help that you need. You know, if you had a broken finger or a sore back or a, or a, um, uh, a challenge physically, you'd go to the doctor. So, you know, if you're struggling mentally, like why wouldn't you go and seek some support from somebody who can help you? And so my my uh, psychologist, um, Dr. Russell from Toronto, he really helped me um, by hearing how it's going. And, and after I would tell him how it's been, you know, the first thing that he would do is validate my feelings. He would say, oh, you are going through such hell or you know you're 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 just going through such you know a uh, challenging time and you know it must be really brutal and already the 250 dollars an hour paid off for me because i was like yes this professional gets it understands it understands me understands how horrible this is and and that alone was worth you know, the money that I was spending to, to seek his help. But he would also guide me from what I thought was doing the right thing to really doing the right thing. And, and so that helped me really w do what I say is take the high road, you know, take the high road and, and do the right thing that's going to support a strong relationship with my, with my children in the end, right? And so that's hard to do because we don't always know what to do. We don't always know what the high road looks like. We don't always, we, and we fall off, you know, we fall into the mud and we, you know, we swim around the cesspool of negativity. And uh, another thing that I encourage people when they're working through conflict is, you know, there's people you can go to, to talk this through. And there's people that you can go to, to who will suck you into the cesspool of negativity and there's people who you can go to, which will pull you up and out of that negativity into the higher um, road, like into the higher way of being. And we know that we have these two, these people on, on in both levels, right? But we choose to go one way or the other, depending on what we want. Um, and I think that that's a really important awareness for people because I know there's girlfriends I can call up if I want to swim around in the cesspool and negativity and be like, oh yeah, guess what happened now? Oh really? What a 
you know, fill in the blank. I, I know um, Andrew's probably going to bleep it out anyway. <laughs> uh, but anyways, you know, you know what I'm talking about. We have people in our lives who will help us swim around that cesspool of negativity. But is that really getting us any closer to what we're looking to accomplish? And when I, when I teach and coach, I tell people there's a cost for everything. You know, there's a cost for conflict. And this is one of the most enlightening things that I help people with is that there's a cost to taking the high road and there's a cost to, to staying in conflict. And, and so either way, there's a cost, but you really have to decide what your, what outcome that you want. And then you have to be committed to pay that price. And that price isn't always what comes naturally, right? It's not always what's habitual. It's not always what your neighbor did or your friend did to, to, to make it through her conflict. It's something different. It's something new. And so that's some inspiration, uh, you know, to, to stay, the, stay the course. But when I started telling this story, I couldn't tell it without crying. And I can now, I can today anyway, sometimes I can't. Uh, and it doesn't matter, I'll still tell it. It'll just be um, with some Kleenex. And I've learned as a keynote speaker, when people ask me what stage props I need, I say, I need a stool and a box of Kleenex because I don't know when things are gonna move through me and I'm not afraid of them and I'll just let them out. But when I tell this story from, from stages, you know, whether that be one-on-one -on -one with a coaching client or, you know, I'm speaking to thousands of people, um, people come to me after and they say, me too. Or they'll say, um, I haven't seen my grandchildren in six years, or I haven't seen my boy or my, you know, my, my former wife took my kids to another country or lots and lots of stories. Like I listened to your podcast, uh, Barbara and Andrew, I listened to your very first podcast and I, and I get a sense that, you know, this is, you, you know, you could easily say me too as well. And, and I, although the story isn't the focal point of my work, I can't believe how many people resonate with it and have this happening in their families because, um, you know, divorce is very popular. Uh, unfortunately, when I do coach people, I don't coach them into divorce. <laughs> I try, I try to help families stay together. I do some family intervention work. Um, you know, you won't find that option on my website because I'm just trying to focus on a certain lane, but, but I do do family intervention work and I do do couple counseling and I, I help bring people to the edge of making that decision. Like, you know, the grass isn't always greener. And either way, you know, you're still carrying around a suitcase packed full of past experiences and pains and burdens that you're going to have to work through whether you jump or don't jump, right? So anyway, you're right. There's a lot of people that hear this story and say, I'm in that same situation. And I think one of the most powerful ones was a young, a, a young lad came up to me one day after I told that story and said, I'm that kid, you know, I'm that kid who's alienated his, his parent. And, um, and so, I mean, that inspires me to keep talking, to keep telling the story. That's a very impacting, deeply inspiring story. And um, thank you for, for sharing it with us. Obviously, you went through a big transition, a transformation, you could call it. And I was wondering how you emerged through your personal conflict on the other side as a stronger person. What, what, mm -hmm. what are some ways you became a stronger or more resilient human being? Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, Andrew was talking about this when he was um, mentioning the the different people that he's, you know, read about uh, in his path, you know, along the way that um, you exercise muscles that you didn't even know you had, you know, you want to, you want to talk about resilience. Um, I, I actually have somebody uh, who just came home who's a speaker on the topic of resilience. I, I'd love to introduce him if, you know, if you're ready for an impromptu uh, podcast guest. Um, and if you are just not and I'll, and I'll signal him to come and share. 
Yeah, it's not, it's, you know, and it's his, I say it's his topic because he's just so darn good at it. But um, um, how I emerged, you know, stronger on the other side, the way that I explain it is like, you know, these are muscles and the more you work them, the stronger they get. If you don't work these muscles, they don't get strong. Um, I think one of the strongest muscles that I've, that I've grown into as a, as a mature, you know, young 50 year old woman is that I have learned the importance of speaking up. I, I probably wouldn't be a divorced woman today if I had the courage or I'll say if I had the balls to speak up more through my whole life, like to my father, to the boyfriends I had when I was younger. Like I, I teach young women how to say no, how to say, you know, go, uh, I'm, you're going to bleep out what I have to say, but you know, it's GFY, you know, like how to teach women uh, because nobody taught me those skills. And, you know, when I, when I was growing up and experiencing my, my puberty and my sexuality, I mean, you know, um, I, I didn't understand boundaries like I understand them today. And I wish I did because I've had to undo a lot of hurt and pain and, and things that happened to me that wouldn't have happened if, if I would have just had a stronger voice, if I would have just known that it was okay for me to really be authentic and really let you know what I thought. Right. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's definitely something that I would really like to continue teaching. Uh, and, and I'll say women, I mean, it's not that I don't want to teach men, but I'm a woman. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, if I have to pick a target market, I'm going to pick women or like me or like women, young women who are my daughter's age, who are, you know, 20 years old, who are, you know, dating and experiencing uh, men um, or, you know, partnerships, relationships, and, and, and really giving people an understanding that they get to choose and decide. Um, and there's consequences for those choices. And, and uh, um, I think that somewhere in my upbringing as a Catholic that um, I, I was, and I'm not blaming any, I'm not blaming any religion or, but I'm just saying somehow in my upbringing, I understood that, you know, I had to be, I had to please people, that it was really more important to please people than it was to please me. And I've reversed that now. It's most important to please me first and, um, and then to please you know, my family, and then to please my customers, and then to please my friends, and so on. So I have a hierarchy now of just who I'll please. <laughs> um, and, and my spirituality, by the way, sits at the top of that hierarchy. So um, I don't feel that I can be guided too far off the path. That's beautiful and so empowering very empowering just to know to please yourself first mm -hmm. to be able to yeah. say no resiliency letting go building trust your spirituality mm -hmm. wow yeah yeah i think uh, andrew was about to ask something before you asked your last uh, question Pretty much what I was going to say was I was going to kind of really wrap up the uh, the power of what you were saying before, especially the three insights that you had. And um, I think if I remember correctly, the first one was don't hold on too tight, you know, learn to basically put your energy out there and let it go. So for the religious people, put it in the hands of God. For the atheistic people, it doesn't really matter. You know, you, you, you just put it out there. You put your energy out there and let it manifest in the ways that it can. Um, and then the second one, if I remember correctly, was the journey, you know, that uh, we're all on our own separate journey. And sometimes the people we love most are going through a journey that will not have you there present in that moment. And then the last one, if I remember, might need a, might need a little help here, Penny, what was the last one? Well, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of nuggets in that, but mm -hmm. to, it was the 
uh, the feeding, like the feeding, it's like feeding. Yeah. Being, being the person that people will be drawn to. I mean, those three lessons I had to learn myself in my own story, um, just being estranged from someone that I care about. And that took oh, even over the course of many self-help books and a lot of self-reflection and a lot of uh, personal failure that those three lessons really stuck out to me and were just really powerful things to include um, and share with the audience. And I think it takes a lot of strength to, to learn those as we go along. Well, um, you know, what I've learned from, from, from my, my partner, Trent, um, is that who's, who's a speaker on the topic of resiliency because um, he was, the survivor of a boat accident that left him paralyzed and from the waist down. And um, um, we met a couple of years ago and I, I heard Trent's story and I, I fell in love with Trent, you know, within seconds of meeting him and his story. Um, I wrote a book called Give and Be Rich. And one of the very first things that Trent told me was that he turned his tragedy into a foundation where he raises money as a swimmer. Uh, and and um, donates um, back to a program called Rise Above Paralysis, where um, he can help pay for durable goods for people who um, have had spinal cord injuries. Um, the story of resiliency is really powerful, and you know maybe uh, um, people would like to find him through me. But uh, resiliency, he says, is not something that that we go out and seek. It's something that we grow by because it's been thrust upon us. Something has happened to us that we must press through. And because of that, we become resilient. So it, just having said that, what it makes me understand is that we can appreciate, we can, we can be very grateful for some of these intense challenges that are presented to us through our lifetime, because if we can embrace them, we become stronger. And that's what I say about workplace conflict as well with teams. I say, you know, the strongest, healthiest teams embrace conflict, not personality-based conflict, but more like conflict about systems and processes and, you know, how to how to sit and hammer it out and work it out and how to have healthy debates and, and that it's okay to disagree. And, you know, so, so what sometimes people raise a voice or sometimes people, you know, curse or whatever, like, I don't know, it's not up to me to say that's wrong or that's not right, but it's just really, uh, it, it makes us resilient to be able to handle the things that, that, come up on a regular basis and there's always going to be things like COVID, you know, we, we, we have all, I'm going to go out on a limb and say a lot of us who are thought leaders, influencers, people like you, like the three of us on this call who are continuing to do our work despite COVID, we have become more resilient, right? And so we can, we can appreciate the, uh, the adversities that we go through. I know that you know, that conflict is not an attractive word. It sounds a lot like combat. Sounds like we've got our boxing gloves on. It's a prickly topic. But, um, you know, through the Play Nice in the Sandbox brand, I make it playful. I make it fun. I help people really get lit up. I say hi, but I, I mean that in the most natural sense. I help them really get you know, reaching for high thoughts and reaching for what they want and stop belly aching and what they don't have and what they're lacking and missing and so on. And for, for the families out there who have estranged members, um, I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I know it, I know from experience that there's nothing more painful than having a loved one that um, is still alive and, and well and capable and is just not showing up to the party, you know, and feeling that, that rejection is very, very difficult and, and hard. And um, one of the things that I hadn't mentioned yet, but I think it's really something I want to stand in so firmly in this lifetime is that 
the absence of face-to-face -face communication is really detrimental to our connectedness as humans. So what, what gives us a, a, a bypass to face-to-face -face communication is digital communication like cell phones and, uh, and not, not just not just the technology, but like, you know, the, 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 the media, right? So for example, um, I heard from one of my kids that they were at a party and that somebody broke up with somebody else in a text message in the same room at the same party. I said, what? How does that happen? Oh, that happens all the time, mom. And I know that it's happening because, I mean, you know, the younger generation is born with this technology in their hand. You know, like I, I watch one-year-olds swiping on an iPad to turn the pages, you know, they know how to use this, like this innate ability to use this technology. In my generation growing up, we had to call our friends. We had to call them up. We had to see them at school. We didn't, you know, if we weren't talking to people, we were isolated. We weren't, we weren't using technology. And I think that we're losing this very important art and it's the art of face-to-face -face. and virtual is fine as well. Phone is second best, but um, if we're trying to resolve conflict with texting or text messages or email, it's hazardous. We can't convey our emotion in text and we can't connect as humans in text. Right now we're connecting as humans far better than if we were all just on the phone because we can see each other. We can see when somebody's talking about something that's delicate or they're getting a little upset or you know, we can see hand gestures and body language and so on. That is so critical and vitally important to connection. And um, like, it's really hard to be vulnerable. It's it's hard to be vulnerable in a text message. I mean, you can, you can spill, your, you know, oftentimes people can feel more vulnerable by writing a letter and writing things down. And I get it. I get that that can kind of help you choose your words and rewrite them or, you know, get things ready and prepared. But when you just send that off in the mail or in the email or whatever, you don't, you don't know how somebody's going to be receiving that. Uh, you know, part of the family I was raised in had a division as well. My, my mom had a son before she married my dad. And as that son got older, he went and spent some time with his biological father and it created this division in the family. And there was letters written and my parents were receiving letters in the mail. And, you know, like you just can't beat face-to-face -face communication and people are afraid to do that, but it really gets it really is the shortcut. If there is a shortcut, which I don't believe there are, but it really is the most efficient way to communicate through challenging times and conflicts. When we're in conflict and we show up face to face, we don't always show up lovely, right? Like, that's why I say playing nice doesn't always mean being nice. Like, what would you rather? Would you rather have somebody sitting across the table from you being really lovely? And meanwhile, they're not really being honest or would you rather somebody sitting across the table from you who's just being honest and not necessarily having a filter on how the words are coming out and how they're going to make you feel i'll take honesty any day me too you know There's absolutely a of liberty to be found in just being authentic yes where you can become liberated right in your communications or yeah. Rated from conflict. Yeah. And, and it requires a safe space to do that. Right. Like, um, I wouldn't ever want to coach anybody to go into an aggressive situation alone. If they fear, if they were afraid of what might happen, if they felt that there was any possibility of physical harm or even verbal abuse. Okay. Uh, it, then, you know, I, I wouldn't encourage them to go and venture down that path on their own. They might want to have some assistance or they might want to have a guide, 
right? Like a mediator. I've learned to do my mediation work. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I studied at uh, Harvard's program on negotiation with an advanced mediation certificate, but really I got so much learning from Indigenous people who use a circle um, as a way of communi communicating. And uh, even when I do my mediations with three people, you know, we kind of sit in a triangle where there's nothing in between us. There's no desk, no tabletop. There's just blank space so we can connect energetically you know connecting and i'll make sure that that is a very safe space for people by negotiating the negotiation before we even get started talking about a few ground rules about respect and confidentiality and you know um one of the things about mediation is that as a mediator you're not you're not making decisions for people, you're just guiding the conversation, like you're facilitating an authentic discussion. People really have, uh, you know, have to want to work it out. You know, if, if, if two people don't want to work it out, mediation's not gonna work because, you know, mediation is helping two people come up with a solution better than each one of them could have come up with on their own, right? Um, but, you know, it's that it's that face to face that's required. And, you know, can I do mediation virtually? Yes, I've learned to do that in the last year. Um, if the situation is getting hostile, you know, it, it has to stop. It has to be managed. Um, but, uh, you know, allowing people and there's a fine balance on what I'll allow, like sometimes somebody will go on a bit of a rant and, you know, you know, emotions will flow and there's tears and, you know, I say there's tears and snot, you know, there's, there's Kleenex involved and there's, and, and I, and I'm, I'm totally okay with that because I say what's coming up is coming out, you know, at, at least they don't have to whack it down in that game of whack-a-mole that I talked about earlier, where, you know, things can come up and out. And if they're, and if that's their process of venting with me one-on-one, -on -one, that's great. If that's their process of venting with me in a mediation or in front of their whole team in a workplace restoration, I welcome that. And I encourage people to just breathe through it. You know, just breathe. A lot of people are uncomfortable with tears and they'll stop talking if the other person starts crying. Or, you know, they'll feel like, oh, we failed because somebody cried. No, that's, that's just emotion. It's like me telling you a joke and you laugh. That's just emotion. We're not going to stop the meeting because I told a joke and you laughed. So we're not going to stop the meeting because, you know, I poked a button and, and it's a soft spot with you and you cried. Uh, we're just going to keep on breathing through it and talking through it. And every time. Every time we get through a mediation, a conversation, a workplace restoration, people have this like, ah, this huge sigh of relief. And they say like, thank you so much. It was so important. We should have done this a long time ago. And that's another thing about conflict. The only thing worse than being in conflict for, you know, 16 years or six, six years or six days is that much time plus one more day plus one more day, right? Because the highest stress is not once you start moving through conflict, that's actually not the highest stress point. The highest stress point is before you start moving through conflict. Yeah. As soon as two people connect face to face, everything changes. There's just something magic. I I'd love to learn more about what that magic is, but it's always there. It, you know, it's, 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 it's about human connection. It's about empathy, compassion. It's about, you know, watching and seeing how you're, how you have affected somebody else and how that somebody else has affected you and really seeking to understand the bigger picture. It's not really about agreements so much as it is about understanding. There's a lot of, yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of good stuff to moving through conflict. Yeah. Well, we're a little over an hour now. <clears throat> Penny, is there any last statements that you would want to say to the audience, to listeners, to people who might be in your shoes right now and just don't know what to do? Well, you know, this is a Broken Families podcast. And, you know, c considering that um, all families have worked through conflict, um, uh, whether they've you know, whether they're stuck in it. I mean, all families have conflict. One of the things that, that it was so influential for me one day, I heard an interview of a 
couple married for 75 years and somebody said to the woman, um, what's your secret? She said, my secret? Well, when we got married and things were broken, you didn't throw them in the garbage, you fixed them. And the way that I thought about that was, you know, like back in the day, you know, if you pulled a nail out of a board and it was bent, you straightened the nail and you kept it. Like we didn't live in such a disposable society where, you know, everything just got disposed in hopes of going out there and finding something new and better. Um, and that was really transformational for me because I, like I said, you know, given the chance, I would highly recommend that families stay together to be healthy, to seek healthy relationships. That could mean that mom and dad or mom and mom or dad and dad or whatever live in different houses. But, you know, children need collaborative relationships. And, and this is why you guys have such a great podcast. And I listened to your first podcast and I know that your mission is to help families understand the value of coming together as in, in unity. Because as you said, Andrew, like half of you belongs to your mom's DNA and half of you belongs to your dad's DNA. And if one of the parents hates the other parent, then half of you feels like half of your DNA is unaccepted, rejected, not, you know, and, and there's a whole thing about that. And I, I, I could point lots of people to your podcast and I will, um, you know, Ginger Gentile's Erased Family documentary attracted me because it was about erased mom. And, and I've been an erased mom for a while. And, um, that manifesto video, when I when I asked my son to watch it with me, because I had his permission to have it done in the first place, but when he watched it with me, it opened up a beautiful conversation as to what happened, and a lot of truth came out, and, and um, um, I don't know, I mean, it's hard for me to answer in a summary, but, you know, in summary, I guess, what I would really like people to leave this podcast with is that... Um, the only way through conflict is through it. This is not comfortable. It's not intended to be comfortable. It's the, it's the opposite of comfortable. It's the contrast. And we need contrast to keep growing and moving through. So embrace it. And if you're struggling, reach out to, for help. Reach out to me. I'll be happy to help people. Um, I'd be happy to help families connect. I'd be happy to help families have the conversations that they need to have to become what they want to become, you know, whatever definition that is for them. And, um, and keep talking about it, talking, like not texting, but keep talking about it, be open, you know, be open to uh, trust. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, I think for some parents, they, 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 they really could let their kids be the guidance system because kids are very resilient and they're very playful and and they don't really hold grudges especially when they're little and they haven't been taught that that skill yet um and um um you know one day i heard somebody uh, at harvard actually i studied with a bunch of lawyers there and and one lawyer said that what one strategy he uses when parents come together to talk is to bring pictures of the children and put them on the table and recognize that that's what you're seeking resolution for is for those those little people right it's it's like if you've decided to move on or somebody's decided to move on against your your choice that like that's something that you need to work on to accept but don't you know don't don't play your kids like pawns in some sick game of chess this is not uh healthy for anybody and um uh and you know recognizing that the greatest value of a family um, for all involved is that everybody can be accepting of everybody else's choices and, and decisions. And, um, and, you know, that, that's really where families are, are going to be best situated for long-term growth and health of, of, of everybody. And, and our kids are watching us, right? Like, you know, I understand that hurt people hurt people, but we certainly don't want our kids to be uh, you know, we, like we definitely need to stop the cycle of hurt and help our kids really 
um, accept the fact that families don't have to look like the old fashioned ones, the, um, the nuclear family. family. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Vinny, I, uh, I just want to say, I feel like we need to invite you back to this podcast again. You have so much to share. If you'd be willing to visit with us again and talk. I with certainly us again. am. I certainly Definitely. am. And Definitely you know, went by very fast. If you want to have some guests who are struggling on, you know, that we could maybe just give them some guidance and help along the way, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that too. Um, so thank you for let me, you know, letting me talk a little bit about wh who I am and what I do, why I do it, what helps. And uh, I am, so, I'm so supportive of the work that you're doing. And um, it's thank just you. very important work very very important and i wish you both all the best with you know connection in the relationships Absolutely. that that really matter to you right and i think mm -hmm. that that's another really important piece we could talk about that <laughs> like you know we don't have to have relationships that don't matter we don't one of the greatest nuggets i've learned about forgiveness in the last year is that you can forgive somebody and still choose not to have a relationship with them. Penny, if people wanted to reach out to you or connect with you or even partake in some of your programs, where would they where would they best go? It's my website, pennytromblay.com. It's P-E-N-N-Y-T-R-E-M-B-L-A-Y.com. And uh, that would be about the best place, the starting point. You know, I do have a YouTube channel and I do have um, social media accounts, but I, I would really welcome people to um, help influence me on what they would like to see me sharing, um, you know, uh, on my Instagram feed. I'm kind of new to that. Uh, I'd like to know what people want to know, you know, I, and, I, and I guarantee you, I am an open book. I'm, I, I am, I'm, I'm exactly what you see. Um, and I'm willing to share, you know, warts and all, all of the mistakes and struggles and challenges and successes and, and really help people live uh, in, into peaceful, happy, connected relationships. All righty guys. And that is all we have time for today. Once again, if you have Thank you for taking the time to be with us. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel, either on YouTube or to our podcast through iTunes or Spotify. Be sure to also subscribe to Penny's uh, YouTube channel as well. And don't forget that we'll have a downloadable document below to help you and your loved ones deal with these different conflicts and all the traumas that come with it. Barbara, if listeners wanted to reach out to you, what would be the best way for them to reach out to you? barbillapoint.com. All righty. And if you wanted to reach me, you can email me at startnow at andrewfockler.com. As always, thank you for taking the time to be with us today at the Broken Families podcast, where we discuss and help you find solutions to divorce, parental alienation, and high conflict relationships. Have a wonderful day, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Okay. Well, that was fun. Ooh. Let's do it again.